The notion of the designer as not just a collaborator, but somebody who has influence in how things can be is a major role in society. Hello everybody, this is Mario. Welcome to a new episode of Design Interview 10 Questions. Today's guest is a woman, but not a simple woman because she is an icon of graphic design. She is Paula Scher. Uh, welcome Paula, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, as I said in the previous interview with uh, Karen Martins, I don't think it's need an introduction, but anyway, uh, Paula, she's a Pentagram partner in New York since 1991, where she uh, designed identities, brand, branding systems, environmental graphics, packaging, publication for a wide range of clients like Citibank, Microsoft, Bloomberg, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Public Theater, and many others that I could stay here all day long, listing them all. Um, so during uh, her career, of course, she received many awards for her works and she is also an uh, AIGA medalist, uh, an AGI member, author of different books like Make It Bigger or Works about her. Um, she's also part uh, of the first series of documentaries on Netflix called Abstract. Nevertheless, she exhibiting uh, her paintings, representing maps, and of course using typography. So probably I forgot something for sure, but uh, when Paula sent me her bio, I mean, I didn't want to be too long in the interview, but at the same time, I had to post everything. So I hope it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. So if you don't mind, we can start with the first question and I always remember to the interview is just feel free to answer whatever you want. Okay. Uh, the starting question is uh, what made you become a designer? I mean, what turned you out to decide to take this way? I, I always wanted to be an artist. I didn't know what a designer was uh, when I was young, I, but I painted and I drew when I, from the time I was a very young girl. I made paper dolls and comic books. And later when I was in high school, I was the publicity chairman and I would make all the posters for the, the school functions, you know, like football games and proms and things like that. And I was known as being good at art. In other words, the, when I look at my high school yearbook uh, before I went away to Tyler School at Art, everybody wrote in it, we know you'll make it, you're good at art. <laughs> But when I got to Tyler, I was actually bad at most things. Um, the, uh, you had to take a found, a two foundation years of school and you, and you did everything. You, you painted, you made prints, you created uh, things with metals, you made sculptures. And I was horrible at nearly everything. In my first year at Tyler, I took a course called Basic Design, which was really the Basel method of, of teaching design. And you moved a black square around a white page uh, for hours. And I thought it was boring and stupid. Also, I was a ter terrible at craft. I, I was very messy and sloppy. I still am. And so my projects were messy and sloppy. So my teachers really didn't think very much of me. As a matter of fact, I had a a teacher who asked me why I was in art school and I said I wanted to be an artist and he said cooking is an art which was you know such a put down then but in my sophomore year in the second semester where at the moment I felt that everything was hopeless I took a course called graphic design not basic design graphic design and it wasn't about being neat and it involved painting and drawing and all kinds of other forms, but mostly it was about ideas. And I was good at it. And that once I became good at it, then I majored in it and then I grew. And that's how I got into it. Um, in the documentary of uh, another graphic designer who is uh, Bruno Monguzzi, a Swiss graphic designer, um, yeah. he say, he, he say that um, 
he started to learn graphic design because for him, uh, graphic design was like a, a common language, a global language to speak to everyone. Also, if you don't understand their languages. Um, I, some, I don't know why, but I thought maybe uh, reading about you and watching all the stuff about you, I had more or less is the same for you. Or am I wrong? Um, I came to that kind of view much later. Uh, you know, when I was young, I was young. Um, and I discovered things by accident. And I didn't have any kind of formed worldview, except for I was in school in the 60s, and I was against the Vietnam War. And um, I began to design in a way that people designed in the 60s. And, and the, the major uh, designers uh, were my heroes, like Pushpin Studios and, and Milton Glaser and Seymour Quast, who I later married. And that I related to that sort of work and work of underground comics and anti-war posters uh, as the language of design that I was interested in. There was a whole other language of design that was prevalent at the time, which was really uh, the international style, which was essentially Swiss modernism that. I thought that that was regimented. I thought it, it was uh, a mask for corporations to hide behind. Um, and I deliberately rebelled against it because those were the politics of the moment. I guess I hadn't even taken the thought about what I was doing as far as Bruno Maguzzi did. I just thought I was expressing the spirit of my times. And what is then design for you today? What is design for me today? What I do as a designer is really to make things recognizable and understood. That, that sometimes I'm just creating a, a, a system by which people can read something. Um, mostly because 90% of my work is identity based, I'm creating some sort of spirit that people can recognize and associate it with something uh, that gives it a particular meaning. Um, and that, that is my form of communication and it is a universal language. I mean, the goal is that everybody can understand it everywhere. Sometimes it appeals to certain audiences and it's focused that way. Sometimes it's more generalist. And once you, you said that uh, graphic design has always to care about the human reaction. So what, what do you think uh, you, you, you create as a designer, like a message or something in this direction somehow? I guess there is a message. The message is usually more subliminal than overt. In other words, if I think about the work that I, I, that I do in New York and particularly for, for cultural institutions, you have a sensibility about the institutions based on the way I've designed for them. Um, you know, the, the public theater is very New York. It's very uh, complicated and constructed with, with a lot of very bold typography and it, it it has come to be confused even as an identity with New York. It, it is this, this co combination of messaging and typography in a city that's dense and active and the design reflects that. Uh, when I designed for the Metropolitan Opera, it was much more refined, much more cool, uh, very withholding, very elegant, serif typography, a completely different feeling. And because they're very different places, if one is very uptown, one is very downtown. One has, uh, uh, has very sophisticated audiences that pay hundreds of dollars for tickets. And the other is, is, you know, has free Shakespeare in the park and is completely egalitarian, you know, so that the design represents the attitude of those places. I don't invent the attitudes, I reflect them. That's what I do as a designer. You mentioned the public theater, 
which is a really famous works from you. Um, in, in that case, uh, you started from uh, a book where you saw the R letter in different uh, thicknesses. And uh, you said, I can use this because then uh, it represents all the people, all different people. Uh, is this the like common way that you, uh, your, is, is your common process that you use when you design? Is, is there a specific process that you are interested in when you design something? Uh, my design process is, is pretty much always the same with very different results. The first part of the, the process is really information gathering to find out why they need to change, to find out why they're hiring me, to find out who they are, to find out what their political structure is like and how they make decisions, to find out whether they're successful or they're failing, to find out all of these things. And generally within them, I begin to understand what they need to be for a public to understand them the way they want to be understood. And that within that, I can define visual cues that will help them become that way. When, if you take the public theater analogy, I found uh, these, this demonstration of typography in a book from Rob Roy Kelly that was uh, written uh, about American wood type. And that Theater advertising at that time did not look at all like the public theater, though they've come to look more like it, which gets me very angry. But initially, I had decided that the messaging would be completely typographically based and that it wouldn't have little cute slogans or it wouldn't have cell lines. It would just be the name of the play the date and the time, and maybe a picture of somebody from the play or some kind of image from the play. And that the style of these things would be consistent so that you would know that they came from the same theater. When I began designing the logo for it, I made that connection to the Rob Roy Kelly thing because I had already determined that I wanted to use bold typography for it. And when I saw his exercise, it, it was really an exercise in showing you the how one typeface could work in all sorts of weights and that the analogy to that and the people of New York was terrific and that by being able to make that analogy I could explain to somebody how some of their goals were being represented in, in how this thing looked and and it was it was a it was accepted almost immediately because if you read the first uh, statement from the public theater, and you read it now and go to their website, it's theater for everyone. It's theater for all. That's the point. All are invited, all are included. Every age, every, every international component, everybody, all of New York are invited to this thing. And that when they have free Shakespeare in the park, it's free to all. And that is the spirit of the theater. And then beyond that, they make the most inclusive theater experience there is, and they launch some of the best plays ever. I mean, that is the home of Hamilton. It came out of the public theater. But do you think the, the client has um, an important and crucial role in, in, in a process? Of course, all, the, all my information comes from the client. I don't know. You know I, there are things I work for that I understand intuitively and there are things I work for where I really have to spend a lot of time with the client to understand what it is they do and why they do it. And, and that those things are, are absolutely necessary to the process. I mean, I don't, I design differently for different types of businesses. It's not that I suddenly become a different person. My approach is the same, but the outcome has to be different. How can all these things be the same? Otherwise, you might as well be back to the Swiss international style and make everything Helvetica. That's the that old method. This still exists. That, yeah, um, you developed so many projects in your career, and you're working also in Pentagram. But as a graphic designer, you probably seen as many. Um, 
Have you ever seen perfection in design? Do you think exists perfection in design? I don't know what perfection is. I mean that some things that are very well, are very perfected, meaning very finished and finalized, are really quite boring because it's the mistakes that are always interesting. So I, I don't think perfection is ever, is ever a goal of, of the, the natural idea of some kind of perfect beauty or perfect harmony. I think there's always some discord that interrupts design. I always feel like the, my most interesting work is when there's a bit of a failure in it. Yeah, I think it also helps to make the, the work more human somehow. Well, um, it needs something to recognize, you know, that if you, if you look at styles that have emerged, you'll always find that the innovator of the style always did something that was a little disconcerting because they made a, they made a discovery. And then afterwards, people who imitated it perfect, perfected it and took out, took out all the magic of it by making it look mundane. You, you studied uh, around the 70s and um, it 60s. was a, a 60s and it, yeah, it was from 1966 to 1970. I graduated in 1970 and moved to New York City. So you, you, you studied uh, in a completely different scenario of the graphic design world because today, I mean, graphic design is so differently from before. But do you think contemporary design, do you like it? Do you think it's better, it's worse? I don't know that I agree with what you're saying. Number one, what the major difference between design when I was in art school and design now is, is technological, not sociological. In other words, it has to do with the equipment. But equipment was always evolving. Typography was always evolving. When I started, it was uh, the major, my major source for building typography was press type. We had to rub, rub something down on a piece of paper. But that doesn't mean that that work looks necessarily primitive in somebody's hands. Some of it was, looks highly contemporary when you look at it now. The, uh, my, my, one of my favorite designers, Reed Miles, who did all the Blue Note covers, the work is all imitated today. It doesn't look any different, really. I mean, the international style looks exactly the same. If you buy the two Taschen books that have the history of design of the 20th century, you'll find that there are things that look incredibly contemporary that were designed in, in all periods. Um, and that, that how it's amazing how little design has moved to, in, from my point of view in, in, that, in that time period. Um, and what we find is formalistically beautiful now is formalistically beautiful then. For me, what I find exceptional contemporarily is uh, the ability for so many bespoke typefaces that initially you couldn't, you didn't do that because you didn't have to, that, that ty typesetters and typographers invented fonts. And originally the fonts were, were, became rare because of the nature of the way you printed and put them together. And then of course they became more ubiquitous. Now with licensing and the way typography is sold to companies, it's better for them financially to own their own typeface. So it's better for them to develop a font that becomes their internal font so they don't have to buy a license for every single employee every three years. And it's, what, it, what happened as a result of this economic, uh, really sort of a, 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 I would call it an, an iron grasp on, on your ability to work with different fonts, is it forced people to create their own. And that, that's, that's sort of made the, the field very, very exciting. I mean, back, you know, 40 years ago, somebody would invent a font for something and they would put it on photo lettering and then, uh, which was the big type company for photo type. And then all you had to do was copy it, change it slightly and change the name and you could sell it also and it would compete with the other font. Now that can't exist anymore. You get sued. Yeah. But today it, we are living in 
in a tec really technological world and uh, we are surrounded uh, of social media like Instagram where people can just click and share their work. And for many designers that I interviewed before, uh, they said that there is no more like Swiss design, Dutch style. Uh, it's now it's global. I mean, one person from here in Milan can do the same design as like in Spain. There's no difference. What makes it, it even it, scarier is that it's almost impossible to do an original logo. Somebody's already done it or they've done something like it. There are no original ideas, They're all, they all exist. It's like just layering of the ideas or, or being able to purchase them. It's become very strange. It used to be that there were uh, uh, different styles from different regions and that's really melded away. That's true. But do, 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 you, do you somehow like this kind of challenge, like in your work, like that maybe you already did something and also in another country they do they can do almost the same sure do i like it i try actually not to pay a lot of attention to it to be quite honest i mean i found that instagram really ruined photography for me because i found that there was so much of it that they made everything ubiquitous so i can't look at a good photograph anymore to tell the difference between that and on instagram with graphic design, uh, maybe I'm more sophisticated and I can see nuances, but I see so many things on Instagram and I have no idea what they were for or how they were used. And I, you know, they emerge and then they disappear. And so for me, what matters is what lasts in the public realm and what people remember. And that there's rep repetition makes something iconic, but on Instagram, a lot of people can like it, but that doesn't make it re repetitive. It doesn't mean that everybody sees it. It just means that people who looked at it at that moment and liked it, liked it. And then it goes on to the next day. I have record covers that I've designed, you know, 45 years ago that live online every time anybody downloads an album. And I just saw one I did online yesterday in, that somebody had tweeted and I forgot I even designed it. It was, it, it's so strange how that stuff resurfaces because it was connected to something else. It wasn't like, oh, I posted this on Instagram. Um, like today, um, Instagram is also a lot used uh, from young designers and students, especially to start their own business. And once we, when we talk with uh, Studio Mut here in uh, Italy, uh, Thomas said that he's seeing that a lot of young interns are starting with a black background instead of a blank white page. And for him was really weird. So Why? Because for him, the, the, the blank page is the, is like the white page, you know, the when you start and instead the black is yeah. like something is coming out from the darkness. Do you know when I paint, I always paint the canvas black first and then do the oh, painting? Yeah, because yeah, you build up color nicely that way. Well, color against white and black operate very differently, so it depends upon what you're doing. I mean, doing something in negative can be more powerful than doing something positive, depending upon the scale of the thing. I don't agree that that, that is... I, I, I think... Don't think anybody, any way somebody gets there is fine with me. I don't have, I don't make rules about how you behave when you make something. It's just only what is the end result? What is it doing? And, and did you make a statement? Did you move the dialogue forward? Have you created something that's worth remembering? You know, I think that that's, uh, how, what is it and how is it used? The, the exercise of making things at home and po posting them on Instagram, I kind of don't understand because yeah. they're not for anything. So if they're not for anything, what are they doing? Yeah, I, I mean, I think he, he meant more that um, young designers start from the black background, not because it's, it's a decision, but more because they are, they are used to, you know, the black screen on the phone. So anyway, like the, the question was more like, what do you think about um, design education today? Do you think edu design education is teaching 
well to young generations or i think it's te teaching just as well as it always did it is it is the goal of young people to find whatever they think is cool and do it and it is the goal of teachers to say oh these kids today all they do is copy the stuff that they think is cool i've heard the same whining stuff about students and teachers for the past 50 years it really hasn't changed one iota it's either the technology or what what some designer did when he ripped paper or you know like whatever the thing is and then they all do it and then they grow up and then they say oh these kids today look at them they're like just doing this one stupid thing over and over again that has never changed don't worry about it that you're interested in it and that you want to do it that's what matters because when you're interested in it and you want to do it whether you've started started with a black surface or a white surface is irrelevant the point is you're making that exploration the more you make the exploration the more passion you have about it the better you get the point is how do you get it so people understand it and recognize it and get to know who you are as a result of it. Because if you're making it in one place where you have a limited audience, which may be your fellow students, that's not enough. One, one part of the education is also, yes, to keep exploring, like you said, and especially because uh, young designers and young des generation of designers, uh, they are going to build the future of graphic design in, in this case, where, where, where do you see the, the graphic designer in the future? Because, the, because there are, I have the sensation there are two uh, different opinions. One that is more like uh, the graphic designer is becoming also a generator of content and not just a translator. And on the other end, the other idea is that the graphic designer is gonna stay like this, so just a translator, but a bit more sharp in static graphic design. Well, I think you're missing giant areas. I mean, I find myself having, um, doing both of what you're describing, but in a much broader sense where, you know, like I've had influence in cities, I've had influence in architecture, I have influence uh, the way organizations and corporations make decisions and that I get to participate in that dialogue and that dialogue is what helps inform what the design is and that part of what you're doing as a designer is educating other people and teaching them how to see and to see what the possibilities are and design is limited by, by, by what people's expectations are and what they'll allow you to do on a grand scale. If you're talking about making little pictures on your Instagram page, you can do whatever, the, whatever you want. But if you want to, say, uh, create a new sign system for a city or, or make some kind of um, improvement to public art or, or have influence uh, in the way a corporation can message itself or a theater can build itself, then you have to be able to have the dialogues with that sort of people and the knowledge base of their business and their needs and understand how design plays a role. And that, that to me is the goal. So you, you see the designer more like independent? I see the designer as a, as a consultant, that the designer I, and I know this, I live two lives because I'm a designer and a painter. As a painter, I go into my room, I like to paint these complicated maps. I've been doing it for a very long time now and I sell them. I also sell prints for them and there's a, not, there's a following and that's a business. It's my, it's my business, it's my expression, it's my thing. I don't, I don't, nobody tells me what I have to do or what I have to put into the map or how I should, what size the map has to be because I'm operating like a fine artist. I can put it in the gallery, they can sell it or it can lie on the floor and not sell. You know, like, I mean, that's just, it is what happens. That's how that industry works. As a graphic designer, I'm a paid consultant. Uh, I'm hired to, to talk to an organization, an institution, a corporation, a city, even an individual, and find out how I can help them make themselves recognizable and understood. And that in order to do that, I need a lot of information and we need to work collaboratively. And sometimes it involves uh, messaging. Sometimes it involves the form of what the whole thing may take. 
Sometimes it involves building things that are three-dimensional in public spaces. Uh, mostly it, it, it involves websites and all forms of uh, social media. And they, they, are, they are plans. They are, they are plans that are executed uh, by me as the designer in collaboration with my clients. And that that is a real relationship. And it's not private. It's not like making the art in my studio. The making my art in the studio, though it takes longer and it's a bigger thing and I do sell them, has much more in common with like taking the black background on Instagram and making a little thing. That's, they're sort of the same. Those are solitary acts. But the notion of the designer as not just a collaborator, but somebody who has influence in how things can be is a major role in society. And it is a major part of design life. And, and you know, and there are some very influential designers with practices like that all over the world. I mean, if you take Rudy Bauer, who I totally admire, he's in, as much involved with urban planning as he is with typography. And that, that it reflects itself in, in cities all over France. I mean, it's amazing what he's done. Um, there are people who plan what the future of airports are going to be. Uh, there are people who, who consider how government can readdress its communication networks with people. I mean, all these things are the roles of designers. If you um, look up design in a dictionary, if you look it up in a dictionary, in most dictionaries, number one says, as a definition of design, a plan or the art of planning. Something that is or organized and has limits. So, yeah. Something, something that is strategic, something that, that, that is future forward, something that is, is, is creating a basis for something to exist. I mean, you can plan a city or you can plan a book jacket. You know, you can plan a book jacket, and book jacket may be four lines of type and have, have three colors on it, but that's still planning. But it's still some forward thing that will happen in the future by virtue of that plan. Um, now we are um, fighting this kind of invisible enemy, this virus. Um, we are unfortunately locked down, so yeah, it's a bad moment. Um, your your works your designs uh helped also like has a, had a meaning uh, they had a meaning for people and so on so i think it's really interesting to ask you this question so what do you think graphic design world but maybe the design world in general can help doing something for this moment sure right now by pure coincidence, I was working with um, a, phil a philanthropist who was an entrepreneur um, who had the idea to create a website and a communications network for people suffering from depression and mental illness, and that right now it could not be more relevant. So we're working very quickly to get the website up. We designed it uh, about two months ago um, before this thing was severe, not for this thing. But, but now it's like this, it's a social program. It's, very, it's gonna be very helpful. And, and it's uh, really a communication network for people who are in trouble. And, and uh, in social isolation, so much of this is gonna be necessary. So the designer's role is very important here. Not just in this capacity, but in all forms of getting information to people, the design, designer's role is very important. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, Paula. It was uh, nice to talk to you. Very inspiring words from an icon of graphic design. You know, the, um, there's a quote from Albert Einstein that I, as the older I get, the more I appreciate this quote. And that is present and future are really just an illusion. That you think, you think in terms that these things are happening, but then you discover they've always been happening. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, thank you again, Paula. Thank you. For everything. Thank you. Take care.